Thanks for that, Brian. Is that right? Is that working? It's outside. It's outside. Right. Okay. Um, well, I'd just like, uh, first of all, to thank everyone um, for inviting me here to talk about my so-called journey, which has been, um, it's been up and down, like a, you know, like the farming game. We never know from day to day how we're, how where we're going to be. But um, all I can say is that I'm not regretting any second of the day or night from changing the way I was, I was taught to farm. And I'm not saying that, that that was a bad way of farming but or working with agriculture, but um, I, I learnt back in my day, uh, I went through Orange Ag College, some of you may have been there, I don't know, or heard what happened. Um, I was the first year in, there was 12 of us um, when it first opened. I think it's very sad that that institution doesn't exist anymore and other agricultural institutions are teaching agriculture because that is one of our weak links and even though in the chain um, which we need to in address um, as soon as possible we need to talk to politicians about this one and, and uh, as many people as we can to get the the message out about the lack of education in the rural industry but anyway enough said on that but I was taught to question that's uh, I got Apart from learning how to drink beer in a pub afterwards at an ag college, um, which I sort of did, um, but I learned to question a lot. And part of my training back then was to go on different farms around uh, the Orange area. And every week we would be on a bus going somewhere. We had a great time. We chatted and we talked. We went to the pub, obviously at lunchtime, and it, you know whatever. But we had to present a paper afterwards and it was assessed and it was about what we thought of farm management. What we thought the farmer was doing, how we thought we could change his ways or maybe there was a suggestion. Um, and that's really the basis of decision making. And the emblem that was on the college emblem there was five petals and they were about decision making. So that was my journey and my, I was fortunate also that my father was very open minded I think and his father, um, and he was always on about saying, well, just do a trial, monitor, you know, this sort of thinking. This was well before Alan Savey came on the scene. Um, and so I did. And, 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 and so I start off in 1980, um, 81, uh, well prepared, I thought. I'd, I, I passed, I got my diploma in farm management and I knew how to make hay at silage and how to do all my budgets. But then we hit the drought of 1981. Now that was a wake <coughs> that was my wake up call. And it's always a wake up call for most people in agriculture, the drought. We can survive the floods, we, we generally do, um, wherever we are. But the droughts are the ones that really knock us. And I couldn't work out why it was that with all the hay sheds that I had and the, the amount of feed that we were struggling at the end. It took me five years financially and um, environmentally, which was the big one, for the land to, re to recover. So Glenn has just showed you how long it took after the, this last major drought um, to recover. How many? Two months after rain? Yeah, well we were in the same boat. Um, after this last drought, but it took five years before. And, and so I was looking to borrowing money, um, you know, the, the things that go on are huge interest rates. Um, and so I had to think, you know, this isn't working. The stuff that I've learnt was all very handy, so I thought, well, I'm, I'm going to do something different. And I was just looking and tri trialling different ways of, of managing land. And then along came Stan Parsons. He was the first to really introduce um, a different way of thinking. He was the economist. Alan Savory was the um, ecologist, more, more along that line. He was also an economist, but more. But Stan was very much a, an educator. And there were six of us who arrived at Armadale, at, a, at the bowling club in Armadale, and he gave a little presentation about, um, a new, about uh, ranching for profit, he called it then. So what I'm talking about today I'm, I'm passing on the certain things which I learnt from Stan and Alan and, and the journey that I've had and, and the, the problems that are associated with what we've been talking about today because they're not all gone but 
So Stan said that um, one of the things that triggered my brain straight away was he said that 60 to 70 per cent of your cost of production are land and labour related. That's the area to focus on, boys. Well, because there were no girls at that time, <laughs> there was only six of us, and I was the only one who actually took on, went to a course eventually later, um, run, run by Stan up at Yapoon. Had to fly all the way up there to learn um, because there's nowhere in New South Wales, there's nowhere else in Australia apart from... And Terry McCosker, as a matter of interest, was learning on the same day. So we, we were the instigators of a different way of thinking. But that economic data, 60 to 70 per cent, and he said, you can reduce that. And, and I thought, well, you know, that's, that's too far-fetched. No way, you know, um, that I could do that. And so we... Here we are today, and I can quite confidently say, and if you don't believe me, you can go and look at all my accountancy records, which I, we all keep, but we have dropped our um, indirect costs of production or our variables by 70%. Now, that is a massive change in economics when it comes to um, being profitable. We talked about gross margin analysis, the profitabilities, um, which Stuart talked about. You know, They're very important, but our costs of production are the ones that are beating us constantly and that's our overheads now which we have to unfortunately we can't tell the shire that we don't want to pay our rates but you know that would be a big help but over and above that it was a learning curve and i just want to um quote something which alan because he came to australia after stan and he he said those of you this was in armadale he was invited a special guest and it was a full house at lazenby hall at armadale university and he said, those of you who are practising cell grazing will probably fail. Well, did that sit us all back on our feet? What is he on about? So what he was saying was that overgrazing, overstocking and overpopulation is not the problem. Rather, it's the conventional decision-making process used by government organisations and individuals that don't provide a framework to manage national ecosystems. A bit broad brush, but basically what he's saying is that it is, it is the decision-making process. And that's what I was missing. So when we walk out the door, every one of you here today will make a different sort of decision because you have different goals. You have different... And those goals or context, as HM people talk about a bit more, but I, ref, I like the word goal. It just sat with me better. But they are based on your values and how you want to implement your way of farming. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> so those, it, 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 it's really about yourselves and how you, how you, where you want to be in this world. And, and some people who've done the course have actually sold up afterwards. And people say, well, that was a waste of money. But no, it wasn't. It was the best decision they made because they realised that they, didn't, they shouldn't be farming. They didn't want to be farming, Dad said, so therefore that wasn't what they wanted to do. But when they started to learn um, that it's about making decisions in relation to their goals and if they don't want to get out of bed or if they want to you know, go intensive and do um, high density stocking or whatever, whatever you want to do, they are all tools in the toolbox. And, and the rest of it flows back, it always flows back to, to how you want to manage and, in, and how I do things on our property is different to other people and I wouldn't say that you need to do exactly the same thing because it won't work because your values, your goals are different. And so the carbon aspect to farming is a part of the whole. And I was at a, a workshop a few years ago when Soils for Life, though, have you know that program, Soils for Life, it was run by the government, federal government, Mike, uh, the late Mike Jeffrey, Governor General, he put it together, but he didn't really understand because he was ex-military, but and that was fine. But he didn't really understand the agriculture side to it. And so I was asked to be present down on the south coast of, down on the southern coast, down near Kealoa, and there was a, a whole room, double the number of this of people here today, full of academics and whatever from from um, from Canberra. Anyway, they, as you can imagine, it was a talk fest and talk fest and talk fest. I was given five minutes at the end of the day to give my talk. Well, it just didn't crack. And I thought, well, this is hopeless, but I'll give it a go. So what I did was 
present with this mandarin or an orange. Actually, had an orange. I peeled it in front of everyone. I'll never do it again. Went all down the front. <laughs> but, <laughs> but what I was sort of demonstrating here is that there are segments in, within, this or within this mandarin. And that's what we're managing. As custodians of this landscape, of this nation, we are managing the whole. And it's time a lot of people, you know, politicians in particular, realise that we are more than just carbon and everything else. We are the whole picture, the ecosystem, the, the, you know, the, the wildlife, everything that's out there. Our property is a wildlife refuge and it was designated that by my father back in the 60s to demonstrate after the 65 drought that you can manage for wildlife as well as make a profit. And it's still a wildlife refuge and, and will always stay that way. We're not impinded by it, but I'll demonstrate through that. And we have koala, platypus, um, all, the, all the wildlife that are there. So this orange, if you think of it, when you peel it next time, just think of all the parts that you're managing and think how proud you would be, you are, if you can manage all those aspects. And of course, human, you know, we're going to talk about this a bit later, but the, the social aspect of farming is just as important as the economic. Uh, what's the point of going down, pushing yourself to the limit if, if, you go, you know, if, if you're feeling not good about it, if you end up with cancers or whatever and, and you end up with all sorts of disasters going on around you? The social aspect of farming is so important and so the guidelines that are provided by learning um, and going down the track I'm not saying it's all good, but it's, um, it's very, very rewarding. So that's just a view from my garden, looking out over the, uh, over the property, and that's the Rumula Creek, uh, headwaters to the Guida catchment. The Guida catchment, of course, goes into the Murray-Darling Basin. So same as it would up here. The water, I assume it goes... Flow. No, it goes east, doesn't it? It goes east. Either way, whether it's the Maclay or whatever, um, we are very important play a very important role. So there we are, west of Urala, um, and <coughs> this is um, fine wool country, it's granite. Uh, when my father arrived on this property, Lana, it was um, lucky to carry half a sheep to the acre. It's now, um, or one to the hectare, but it, it, it's more like uh, five times that now. Um, and, it's, and, and it was spear grass, aristida, and bare ground. And it had been burnt and burnt and burnt. And, and so he had, he had a, a very low base to work off. Isn't that very different to, to um, the eastern side or where, you know, what Stuart talks about, Wilmont and whatever. But it doesn't matter about the soil type. It's actually, you know, I realise later, it's how you manage it that matters. So we have these rocky outcrops, um, hence the koala, whatever. Good shelter for lambing ewes. Um, and then that's a bit of an overview. But just one thing about that. That shot there is really is sort of showing the corridors. The, wild, the timber is all corridor. All the whole property, if you look down on it, it's all natural. It's, it's the way it's been. Uh, fortunately, it wasn't over cleared, but it, but the wildlife all linked to that together. So I'm a bit of a stickler for wildlife here. You probably gathered that already. Um, and it's very important. If I, I'll bring it up now, um, in terms of what Stuart was on about with the carbon. We can't have carbon unless we have biodiversity. They, li they are intrinsically interlinked. One segment is linked to the other on that mandarin. So we've got to move on. And um, there's some certain things happening, uh, which I'll talk about later, um, to do with natural capital accounting. And that brings in the biodiversity aspect. And fortunately, in the next, uh, hopefully next year, there will be enough data, enough to prove through that, through that process, natural capital management, that um, we will be rewarded for our wildlife as well as the carbon. So that's a great step forward. So Glenn touched on this a fair bit, you know, um, the, the decisions, social, economic, environmental. Um, politics is also a big impart, big, uh, an important part of it as well. You know, that's, we can do something, but then the party or political party will decide to do something else. And, and then we're thrown out the door about, and we're not recognised for what we're doing. So the need for change, I've talked about that, that's what we used to do. But this particular shot here, I'm going to ask someone here to tell me what was the real issue there. 
No, it wasn't water. I took the photo because we were, I, I had this drilling rig there, obviously looking for water. And there's so my wife sitting there, that, and I've just cleaned the dams out. But can someone else quickly tell what is what is the real issue there? I couldn't see it when I took the photo. No, you're close, you're close. Management, Management yeah. Yeah, but what was telling me, it's a bit hard unless I, I should have, I could focus in and, you, and you'd see. But it was bare ground. That's the issue. Now that was the, that was the 1981, 82 drought. And that's when it was costing me. This is the height of the 2017, yeah, 2000, that was taken um, in winter. Uh, 2019. Similar sort of photograph that, that, that Glenn, Glenn was showing of the same spot. Now there's the water still there and I have and everything now is all reticulated by solar energy. Um, I used to use little solar impeller pumps but I don't use those hardly anymore. So it's all solar reticulation but the, the interesting part there is that the trees are healthy, the landscape looks healthy, uh, clean water and that's at the height of the drought and that's the amount of debris, so, you know, the amount of Grouse ground cover that I left behind. This brings in Christine Jones and um, Judy Earl. So when you when I first start this, and I'd say anybody who wants to do something, ensure that you do some sort of trial, trial and error. If you're not sure, do a trial. Make you know, do a block like Glenn showed, um, and try and watch and monitor what you're doing. So we didn't have any data to show that. Back in the day, when I started, there was nothing. I was the village idiot, and you can imagine, you know, Tim was just moving around stock, and um, one day I actually pulled hay sheds down in, after the 94, 95 drought, because one, one was blown away big or whatever, because I didn't have hay in it. Anyway, one side went, and I thought, I'll blow it, I'll just pull it down. And then I pulled another one down, so I didn't have any hay sheds. Now, imagine how that, that conversation would sit back then. That was before regenerative thinking came in. But I knew that I, there was an answer to that, and that was to have a grazing plan. So I needed data, because the scientists, the Department of Ag at the time, um, they would come in and really give me a hard time and say, well, where's your evidence? We need scientific, scientific evidence. My answer to that is quite simple. Where was the evidence when the Wright brothers invented the aeroplane? Where was the evidence when Thomas Edison invented the light bulb? There was no evidence, but he had to proceed. He had to carry on and learn from mistakes. And that's what this was about. So Professor Wal Whaley, who I've got a lot of time for, retired, retired now, but he got Christine Jones and Judy Earle to come to Lana to do the first, I think it was the first ever trial um, scientifically tested trial on um, what we referred to then as cell grazing. I don't like that word. It's planned. We do it under a grazing plan. It's not based on a cell. And that's all it is. And so that was what it was like. Bare ground, a little bit of malaine in here. Um, yeah, and that, that was the... That was the uh, the control, that was the area where we started, and we, so we had to do three of those. I'll just go back a little bit, but we had to go do three of those, try, um, four, four separate sites, and we had to, I had to keep a, keep a control, and that was not easy, trying to, wanting to move but can't, so I had to leave the stock in, and so it went on for about three or four years, and some of the data I'll show a little bit later, but that's what changed Christine and Judy. Christine, could, she was blown away by the changes that was happening and, and it led her to go further and further now she speaks all around the world. So it was very, and I've got um, a couple of uh, these, there's only three of them, that is the actual trial, the, the results of that trial and if I had more everyone would have a look at it, so it was suggested that someone with a, with a really good question can have one of those. So there you go. <laughs> so. So I learned that it wasn't just about hay sheds and making silage, etc. That animals actually are our tools, and so the more we, whether we go high density stocking or whatever we do, or that's up to us, our goals. But they are a very important part of the. And that was taken. Sorry, um, that was taken during the 94-95 drought. And I'll show you the graph at the end of 
the changes from 1980 right up through to 2000 um, and uh, not 20, and, and and that is really quite interesting. So, so as as Glenn was pointed out, rest is a really is a tool. Rest and and recovery is an important tool, and you vary that according to where you are. So, if you were out at back at Broken Hill, you'd want a longer recovery phase because your rainfall isn't as high. Well, see, up till today, it, may, it might be a different story, but. Um, but generally, it is a, it is a drier, more, what we call the, refer to as the brittleness scale, from 0 to 10, and the higher that number, the more brittle you are. And I'd suggest that where we are in these tableland areas, we're more like around 6. We're more brittle, actually, than we are humid, you know. Um, so we've got to manage the land and have a recovery phase that suits that. So we have a grazing plan, and that is what I did not learn when I was at our college. I did not learn about biology either, and that was another story. But it's basically, this is the, uh, showing you the growth for the growth curve. And this area just here, um, I don't know where the red button is, but um, it's showing, that, that area, the summer period is really your hay shed. You don't graze it up there, you know, you don't take that amount off, you save it. And that's the amount, so we have a buffer if we can see it here, there's a buffer, and that can vary according to what we're doing. Sorry? Can't. Oh, gee, I'm sorry. Yeah. I can't try and talk into it. Um, that, that might be better. I've actually got to go like this. So the feed buffer is what took me through the droughts. I did not have that in 1980. I had no decisions about how I was doing it. The hay shed was, not, was, was really only a small amount of feed, really, relative. So the buffer, I could plan ahead, no different to what Stuart was saying. He can plan ahead, he rings his managers up and he'll say, well, how much feed have we got ahead? I could see going into 2017, we actually had less rain than where Glen is. Because the, the western side, dropped, we didn't get that rain that came in from the east or whatever it was. But we were six months, we were six months ahead in the drought in that period. And so... I could see that we, 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 we had enough feed, I could always plan ahead for about a year and a half. And it might seem a bit crazy, you know, to be able to plan that far ahead, but um, about a year and a half I thought, yeah, well, we, and that's allowing for a, a, a big adjustment in terms of grazing pressure, adjusting the stocking rate to suit the environment. So the environment was dry, we adjusted back and I got rid of probably 70% of our cattle within two weeks and some of those were adjustment cattle as well because I take on extra stock um, and the guy didn't like it at all the guy had the, because he said well you've got plenty of feed and I said no I haven't and um, I was planning ahead he couldn't see why but anyway they had to go but and, and we still do a lot of adjustment so so the grazing plan has, has led over the years to that reduction in cost of production because we're not putting the superphosphate out, and that's, a, that's always been a difficult one to talk about, but it was sort of explained about the roots going deeper and the mycorrhizal fungi and the benefits, if we get it right. And there's a book I would suggest, if you could try and read it, it's called um, uh, One Straw Revolution by a little Japanese fellow who's not with us anymore, but um, Manuku Fukuoka. And he talks about thatching, and he was a scientist back in the Second World War days, a biological scientist, and he um, had his own little farm outside a little village, probably no bigger than Murundi, and his little five-acre five property fed the whole village. And he did it without any chemical, without any inputs. And it's based on thatching, on laying down. He had his rice crop, he had his cherries, he, he did everything. It's a fascinating little book, um, but that's sort of explaining how we, you know, that you can do it. So I had to, I had to fence. I realised that uh, we started with 25, 30 paddocks in my father's time. And it was two or three paddocks when he arrived. Then he put a few big fence lines in, um, all timber back in those days. And so I had, to ref I had to look at how to do this. So what we've got here... Our prop, the house is just in this area here. We've got eight, eight farmlets. I call them farmlets. They're not cells. 
because we are farm managers, aren't we? That's what we are. We're farm managers. So on each one of those, each one of those, um, there's around a minimum of 30 paddocks, more like 40, um, in a plant grazing, and I have different classes of stock. Like if I want to have an adjustee that wants to come in or put extra stock on, it's for biosecurity reasons as well as ease of management. And so they have their own farm, and then they and I have cattle yards, sheep yards, um, which are generally combined the two. Um, in each one of those, and it, as a matter of interest, um, eight and a half thousand acres here. It's um, well, 3,400 hectares, and the average size is 10 hectares. But the area that's given us the most return is the one in this area here, which is now new, it's not on that lines, uh, where I've gone down to four hectares. And that's permanently fenced, permanently watered. And those areas are three times the carrying capacity now compared to the rest. So the, the, the potential is huge, but I'll leave that up to my next generation to, do the, to go the next dog if they want to. But the cost of this, people say, wow, that must have cost you a for pretty fortune. I get that question all the time. And I say, no, it didn't. You can't afford not to, to implement a different program. Stuart put it out very plainly in big money terms is what it costs. Um, and I know it's expensive to put up a kilometre of fencing with a contractor these days. But I get it all back. I work on the basis, and this is a follow-on from Stan Parsons, econ economics, is that you aim for a 100% return on capital within two years. And most times out of ten, nine times out of ten, you'll get it within one. So, and that was bit by bit. You work into it. You work for you work. You plan your way forward, and you think, yeah, I can do this one. And then you think, wow, this paddock's not performing as well. And all of a sudden, you've got another fence in, a bit more poly pipe. Once you've got your infrastructure there, in terms of tanks, pol um, solar pump pumping, it doesn't cost you much to carry on. So, the potential is is quite quite amazing, really. So we went. Um, Two and a half, three thousand DSC per farmlet. So this is the back country. It's very challenging country. Never had an ounce of fertilizer on it. Very low. Um, I think the organic, um, the humus level uh, of that would be lucky to be one or two percent, or it was, and now it's more than three or four times that. But I'm, I took that photo one day because it was showing dandelions that have been grazed. You can see, it looks like we've harvested canola or something, and this is the, what the sheep, they ate the dandelions. Now, a particular agronomist came to me a number of years before I'd started this program. He said, this needs so many tonnes of superphosphate, it needs this and needs that. And it, I was no way I could afford to put on what he was recommending. But, it, but he said, the dandelions are an indication of very acid soil, and maybe it is, but so what? The sheep loved them. They will eat it, and the dandelion is actually got deep, deep taproot, and it'll go down, tap into the nutrients that are there. If they weren't doing that, why is it that they've eaten all those heads off? So it's just showing that by changing the landscape, and that's without any superphosphate, that, you know, like it's very low soil. So this, this goes back to Christine's work. I'm just showing this one because that's before and that's after. Within three years, photographs were taken, these ones here were taken on the same day. That area had a storm on it, that's why it's greener. But it's showing the transects that were put in. And you can see the amount of dry matter. And so that was really challenging. So you can see just from that alone how important it is to have a grazing plan. That's really what it was about. This was the other result that came from that study. It was showing the change in Elemis scabra, which is a cool season perennial, and Eragostis, which is the love grass Glenn was talking about, and how it changed relative to the bottom line. Um, continuously grazed versus planned. The plan is the dark line. And the same here, we had a, an issue to do with uh, Juncus or uh, Pinrush, and our land care group, actually this is, what, this is what it was all about, we got $5,000 to do the study for, through land care. And we were focusing on, on the pin rush. Why is pin rush increasing? We thought, oh, it's something to do with acid soils or whatever it was. But it was grazing management. It turned out that it was due to largely bare ground. 
and so because of the way we were managing. And the, you can see this one here, Aristida or Speargrass. There's two types of Speargrass. There's Aristida and Stiper. But the Aristida was the one which was really affecting the wool clip because we're a hot, fine wool growing country where we are. Those beautiful fine wool. And we were discounted hugely by the amount of seed. We used to, uh, when I was classing, I was a professional classer, but um, I, I would have to pull out at least 10%, you know, like the VM would be at least 10% in, in our skirting lines. And now it's lucky to be two, one or two percent. So that's showing some changes. This one really challenged, you can imagine the Department of Ag fellows uh, really folding their arms up on this one because how is it that we were getting um, this change in the orange here, plant graze versus the conventional. What is happening? Now, I couldn't answer it properly there, and I still can't. All I could say was that all I know is that it's working. But I think the demonstration that Stuart put up there to do with the carbon and the root zone going down deeper, that to me is, is a big part of the answer because we're tapping into a lot of nutrients which we've ne never had a chance to. They've just been sitting up at the top. And when we do, if we do, when we go out, I'd like to demonstrate about the little engine in the plant, the fuel tank, and how important it is that we keep that fuel tank full. And if we don't, that's why you have to move on. I'll go, we'll explain it a bit later. But anything over 10 days is, you know, you're starting to get an overgrazing of the, of the plant because the fuel tank in that in that grass is not replenished. So we can you can ask questions about that later. But that was the very early days, um, and no superphosphate was added. Now this one here shows an effective and an ineffective water cycle. Simple as that. This is the height of the 2018, 19, 2019 it was, going into Christmas when the dust was blowing off. So we had a storm. This is the neighbour on the left and we're on the right. That's the amount of feed that I'd kept back, which was uh, probably well uh, over two tonne to the hectare. Two and a half tons. So I, de I destocked and um, early in the piece, kept that amount, and just kept the sheep, offloaded the cattle. The sheep I didn't have to feed at all. So I basically went through this whole drought period without feeding hardly anything, just Himalayan salt minerals, which costs 60 cents uh, DSE per annum. That's what it cost me to do that. So they've got to have the mineral, um, but and also bypass protein, which I can talk about later. But you can see the amount of water. Now the guy on the left, I saw him in the pub this in Urella, the night that night of the storm. And he said, Tim, Tim, how much rain have we had? And I said, Oh, oh, well, I think we've had half an inch or something, Dan. And he and and um, he said, That's really great, really great. And I said, Yeah, well, I just want to show you something. He's never really enjoyed that photograph <laughs> because I said. That's us, that's you. <laughs> You've lost 90% of your water today. And that really hit home. He said, oh, you won't like me for this. He said, no, I don't. And I said, well, think about it. You know, that is, that is a plant grazing. That is not. And so I think that's a great photo because it, um, it just, and that was within three minutes of, of the storm. You can still see it, still going through. See the water running, how clean it is and how dirty it is and on there running off. So I won't harp on it, but there we go. Um, now this is on a property at Coonabarabin, and my son's managing a place out there uh, during the drought. He's now got a huge operation, a big, big job now he's working for, and I can talk about that. But that's where a, ba a bale of round, a round, round bale of hay was fed, and he, he direct drilled um, a crop of oats in. You can see the effect of the mulch. That's all that was demonstrating, was the effect of litter, having ground cover. That, pro the mo that paddock was sort of basically set stocked. But it just shows um, how, how effective a good water cycle is. So a 1% increase in soil carbon will lead to 168,000 litres more water held in a metre of, of each hectare. That's huge, isn't it? Now, we listened to Barnaby talking about wanting to increase the dam supplies and put more water in. Our biggest dam is underground. He just can't get it. He, you know, I'm sorry, but, but I, I, it annoys me a bit when we, we can't... <laughs> sorry, okay, let's sit down this side. <laughs> but um, it just is frustrating that we can't see that our water underground is, is the dam. 
That is the dam, the water that we're restoring now. So the next drought that we're coming into, if we've got a good ground cover, guaranteed that all of you here will get through the drought a thousand times better if you have a grazing plan that keeps the ground cover there. And if you don't have it, watch out. You'll need more than just one wool shed. So it's not just about CO2, which we talk about so much often, but should also be about increasing the amount of water in the atmosphere. And this happens if we focus on improving the water and our mineral cycle. So we have a really important role to play. And I'll just talk about right now a quote that I heard um, on the radio on ABC. It was a scientist, and, or a couple of scientists, from, and they had some big, big talk fest over in Europe. And, they said, and this guy came out and just said, well, if you look at all of Russia, the Ukraine, North America, Canada, you put all that area together, that is the total area of desertified land in this world. Now that is huge. That's what's happening. It's the desertification. That's what Alan Savory was on about. He bangs his head about it. It's the desertification that is just as important here as CO2. So we have a, so when, when you go into Sydney and you see more and more cement being poured down, it's all a, aiming, aiding the, uh, the, the heat. It's the warming of the atmosphere, not just... So we have an important part to play. Just reverting back a little bit here about the water cycle. That's how a uh, solar pump goes into a little tank, fed a tank. We have the solar unit there, like the spring-fed dam, and reticulated from there. This is just prior just after the first rain event in uh, it was in 2019 before the big break um, and that's showing glycine now glycine is a perennial legume it goes right down a meter or more there's different glycines but this one here uh, has a purple flower and it's just growing up through the debris that was left okay so again showing the ground cover um, and this is Capellopedium, uh, summer perennial. So what we aim to, uh, this is just demonstrating the range of species that we've got to aim for. We don't, uh, don't ever manage for one species. Manage for the range. Cool season, warm season. Rachel Lawrence, Dr. Rachel Lawrence did some work on Lana uh, through the university and she looked at parasitic wasps and she was looking at the relationship between organic matter and insect life. And I thought that was brilliant, great. It would be great to see. And she did it on 12 different properties, but she found that even during the height of the drought, ne compared to next door where that water was running off, we still had our parasitic wasps. Next door was hardly anything. And they are vital because um, we don't have much issue in terms of tree d dieback and whatever because of the um, caterpillars, you know, the witchetty grubs or whatever you want to call them, that live in the soil. The parasitic wasp actually eats them, the same as they do fly larvae. Very important for sheep production, I think, you you know. So this is part of the what we call community dynamics. And so we've got to think in terms of that. This is the Ramallah Creek. Just showing a few shots here, um, which flows our main creek. And you can see the I put, took that photo because the grass grows right down to the water's edge. And there's platypus living in there. And... We don't have to fence. I don't actually fence off, the, even though it's contradictory in some ways. I don't fence the riparian area. The whole property, if you look at it, all the creek lines are part of the, of the whole. And so if I want to, I can avoid those creek areas because they're bigger paddocks, and then, or I can go in and do a quick grazing out. But there's no tracking, there's no damage, um, and, and there's times when I do need to graze those creeks just to stimulate the growth. Otherwise, you'll end up with more moribund grass. So we're just showing here the dung beetle activity. Um, we all know how good, how good that is. This one's showing substitution versus supplementation. Think of it that way. Are we supplementing or are we substituting? This is uh, dry lick or it's um, cotton seed meal, uh, any, any uh, dry bypass protein. And that's what we can use to stimulate the diet, the stomach of the animal with a bit of Himalayan salt as a mineral. And that's all they need in a, in a dry environment. So this one here is, is what I'm, I'm heading towards. So if I can, um, I can't really, on, I haven't got the arrow on here. Um, on the left, you'll see where we started in 1980. 
and you can see this is the rainfall and there's the stocking rate and, and how it's adjusted. So back in 1980 we, we had the uh, seasons changed and I got adjustment stock on. That's all adjustment stock there, right through cattle that came from Queensland. And I used those cattle because the Brahmins are very good grazers and they will graze differently to the European breeds. And so they bashed it all down, bashed the spear grass down. And anyway, so they, they've gone but they did a great job. But you can see here the gap. This is the 94-95 drought. Now, that was the, cha the, my, the challenge for me. How am I going to handle this drought? And that really lifted me when I realised that we actually went through, uh, we destocked by about 30% uh, or something, if that. Um, and that's, the, that's showing the difference. Whereas here, the rainfall is actually higher than the stocking rate what we, in 1980. And that's when we were in trouble. So you can see the big gaps here, 2002, we had another dry spell. And then we get the big one, 18, 19, sure, dramatic drop. But I had to do that like we all did, most of us did anyway. I didn't feed though, it was, they just went. And now I've, I've got over five, 600, five to 600, between five, 600 adjustment cattle on, plus uh, 3,000 odd sheep, all used, breeding. And so they, uh, we're back up here again now, 2022. I haven't updated the graph, but with a higher rainfall, we're back up here. So it's just showing you the, the change of management. That's really what it's demonstrating, how the water cycle, mineral cycle, etc., have really flowed on. I put this in for Glenn. <laughs> he likes to play around with the bits and this and that. Yeah. <laughs> but I, that machine is gone. But this was when uh, we were talking about tro uh, tropicals, tropical pastures, putting in um, bambatsi or whatever it was. And I thought, well, this was in drought. This was during the drought time. I'll, I'll see if I can fast track a certain... We had three paddocks that were um, managed differently in my father's time, I'll say. They, they were disploughed, chisel ploughed and whatever, and re-sown. And they'd never been the same since. This is back in the 60s. Still hadn't recovered properly. So I thought, well, I'll direct drill... A uh, bit of the stuff in and just see what happens. Well, part of holistic thinking, decision making, is assume you could be wrong. You never assume you could be right. You just assume maybe, just maybe I could be wrong. And sure enough, that machine was sold within 12 months. So I could see from the, you know, we got a good response and all the rest of it, but compared to next door, it, it didn't break even. It didn't break it. It wasn't, it wasn't necessary. The native pastures actually were exceeding the... Um, yeah, so if I let this go now, th that particular paddock where I had that machine, it's now a metre high, the grass. And it's not because of what I did there. It's just purely the, the grazing plan. So I'm going to summarise um, with some pr basic principles, which I let, I've got a few here, uh, a few handouts. Some of you might have got them. If not, they're going to be put out. Uh, some of yeah. The, yeah. But you said they could be, if they haven't got them, they And we can email that to them or email them. Yeah, and the story. So we're basically, what we're basically saying, look at your values in life, wh what you want to do, whether you want to be a farmer or not, and um, match your enterprise to suit the environment, not the other way around. That is so true. You know, um, it annoys me a little bit when I see big irrigators going around and around if they're not in, if they haven't got the water supply, it's all right if you've got the adequate water. But when they're just pumping out little water holes, it, yeah, it doesn't add up. Um, so the, match the stocking rate. Don't overgraze, or underuse and underutilize. Manage for the range of species. A big one. Like I was managing before, um, when I first started, I was managing for Aristida. No, you let the, the Aristida is a, is a low successional plant, and it went. It just disappeared. And the same thing can apply to thistles if you, if you get it right, get your ground cover right. So rest or recovery is a tool. And aim for 100% ground cover all the time. Use a flexible grazing plan and you plan for clean flowing water. As we saw, plan to supplement rather than substitute. And question your decisions based against your goals. Just question all the time. What are we doing? Um, why are we doing this? Assume you could be wrong. And the one at the bottom here, number 11, is probably is one that um, I put in there is uh, what I call blinkered thinking. Um, when, when we 
what may be pleasing to the eye does not necessarily mean it's pleasing to the bank balance. And I'm referring here to an oak crop. There's so many people plough up their land, sow it all down, spray it all out, put an oak crop in, and then they've got nothing the next year or whatever. And so you, if, you, if you do what Cole Sice has done, and Cole and I have worked well together over many years now since he started, and you pasture cropping, that's a different story. But when you're just destroying that landscape uh, totally and relying on some exotic from Europe, when really the natives have been here for, th what, millions of years? Millions. They've evolved. And what are we doing? We're spraying them out, ploughing them out. The natives are part of the picture. And we've just got to learn how to identify them and how to manage them. Microlina sipoides, microlina, an all-year all green perennial, beautiful grass, um, on the particularly up on the northern tablelands. So the environmental debate, it's not livestock that are the ongoing problem. Rather, it's the way we manage them. We should manage to suit the environment rather than the reverse. Livestock can regenerate the landscape if managed by matching the stocking rate, the carrying capacity. The most urgent challenge of present civilization today is to understand that the drying out of our landscape has a much more serious impact on climate change than an increase of CO2 in the atmosphere. That's challenging, but that's the reality. And also, we're talking about um, agricultural health equals human health. If we've got good healthy food, high protein food, we should be a lot healthier in ourselves. Thank you.